I'm Michael Gatt. It's good to be back at scale after several years. And i uh, going to be talking today about technology cost management, which is a topic I was first asked to speak about for a meetup group about six months ago. And this presentation has rolled around through a few different iterations until we finally got to the one that you're going to see here today. It's the last talk on Saturday. I'll try to keep it a little loose and casual, and hopefully you'll all learn something. Maybe I'll learn something. Um, but I'd like to start with a story. Um, this is a story about cats on keyboards. Uh, it goes back to my first job many years ago. I was working for a large bank, and I was part of a startup division of a bank that had taken some software I had written in a previous role and were applying it to something new. They brought over a banker from England who was going to run this startup division. We had a great launch. Um, after our launch, we acquired a couple of big customers. We had, a display, um, we had a demo for a bunch of customers. They loved it. And after that, we gathered and my, uh, well, our, I guess he was a general manager of this division, told us we had done a great job. But at the end, he kind of gave us what at the time felt like a bit of a backhanded comment which, or a compliment, which was that you all have to remember, these customers love what we've shown them. They love our technology. They love the fact that we've mastered this technology, that we're doing things that nobody else can do to serve their needs. But keep in mind that if somebody else can do the exact same thing by having a million cats walk over a million keyboards and generate the same result for less money, they're going to go with that competitor. And at the time, that kind of hurt. And as a technologist, it still kind of hurts. But it's true. We exist generally in the service of businesses. Those businesses have to make money. One of the ways they make money is by being careful about how they spend their money. And that's what this talk is about today. Um, key takeaway, that top bullet point is engineering is where science meets economics. I don't know who first said this. I can't claim credit for it myself, but I do think it's true. Um, as engineers, we learn a lot of science, but it gets really powerful when we are able to apply it in a situation where the economics work. Otherwise, we'd all be pure researchers off doing something else. So a little bit about me. I told you about my first job. I'm most recently a technical program manager from AWS, which I left last year. Um, <clears throat> I've been an IT consultant. I've worked with open source. I've been a scale volunteer for many years. This year, in addition to speaking here, I'm running the observability track. Um, and what else? I'm originally from New York. I serve the needs of two cats, um, one of whom you just saw. That was Flash. He's named after a memory, a memory stick. Not kidding. <laughs> There's a story behind that. Um, why talk about anti-patterns? Well, because patterns tend to matter. Uh, if you were here for Casey's talk just a few minutes ago, uh, he talked a lot about, don't worry about the detail, recognize the patterns. Same is true when dealing with cost. And giving specific proactive advice on any general topic is really, really tough to do. So I'm giving advice on what not to do because I've found that if you avoid doing all the wrong things, you'll constrain your choices to things that are at least somewhat right. And that gets you, depending on the circumstances, anywhere between 50 and 80% to where you need to be. And you know, besides, it's just easier. Th this was actually intended to, to be a joke, but it really isn't. It's uh, proactive advice is hard to give on a general topic. Um, 
given that everybody has slightly different needs. Uh, there's a bunch of things I won't talk about. Um, the biggest one that you tend to find that um, comes up a lot in costing in uh, companies these days is forecasting and planning. That's just a huge topic that could be a presentation on its own. I won't get into it. Um, so, overall framework. There are two big buckets of spend for any tech org. It's the people and the infrastructure. Usually the people are the biggest piece of it. But Conway's law teaches us that our people and our systems tend to mirror each other. So the thing that I'd encourage you to keep in mind as we're going through all of this is for every one of these anti-patterns in infrastructure, there's a parallel anti-pattern in what your organizations are going to look like or not look like. Um, and I'll go through various scales um, or various dimensions, the scale of the enterprise, strategic plans, architectural issues, and lots of operational and tactical stuff that will do. And the 10 points I'll go through it through will kind of hit all of these starting in roughly that order. So my top 10 used to be 12. Scale of the company is someplace you've got to start. I'm sure in this room we have everything from small startup to massive hyperscalers. They cannot look at costs the same way. One of the things I will say more than once in this presentation is you are not Google. Well, some of the people in this room might be, um, but most companies are not Google. Most companies can't do the kinds of things I used to do at AWS where you would get a half percent gain. Wow, we just saved $200 million. Uh, when you can save $200 million for half a percent, you can spend a lot on efficiencies. A lot of my old consulting clients here in LA would not save enough from an efficiency or cost management project to justify the project, let alone doing the kind of ongoing continual improvement we did at AWS where you needed a full-time team for it. <clears throat> so <coughs> a lot of companies, and this is not unique to cost, tend to jump in and decide, we're gonna do that because we heard AWS does it. Uh, bad idea. Um, bad cloud strategy. Most of us are going to be in the cloud to some degree today. Unless your initials are DHH, some of you are familiar with that person, um, in which case you spend most of your time ranting online about why the cloud is awful and how great you are for moving away from it. This is David Henmeyer Hansen of, uh, well, he, he's the inventor of Ruby on Rails, among other things. Uh, the cloud will generally not save you money, and I think that's the biggest thing to remember when you're coming up with a cloud strategy. Over the very long haul, it may, but the savings will be a bit squishy in the sense that what it really allows you to do is move a lot faster and do more for the same money. Uh, it's not that you will save money. In many cases, you will spend more. Uh, there's no such thing as cloud neutrality. Forget about it. Um, I've included a link to in, in my slides, which I'll share with you, <coughs> excuse me, um, to just a very simple demo of I'm going to move a simple containerized app from AWS to GCP. Um, some of you have tried this. Uh, it's not easy and there's relatively little benefit to it. So a lot of companies constrain themselves on, well, we don't want to be too tightly tied to one cloud. That's not something you should do. Don't worry about being tied to one cloud. You probably are, whether you believe it or not. Um, 
but which one you choose might matter depending on what they charge and what services they offer for what you want to do. Uh, one of the bad things we tend to see, and this is typically true of older companies that have migrated to the cloud, is a lift and shift where you kind of treat the cloud as your data center. And you can gain some efficiencies there, especially by scaling things up and down that you can't do in a data center, but you're really not gaining the biggest benefits. Um, and you need to be careful about how you do cost analysis. One thing I've learned through many years of moving stuff to the cloud is if you want to gain the benefits, you probably need to re-architect around what the cloud allows you to do. You won't just move your architecture. Um, one of this, these, this cost analysis that I linked to here was a company called AREFs. I'd never heard of them. But they are apparently a huge SEO company based out of Singapore. They run a massive web crawler, and they published a paper where they said, oh, over three years we've saved $900 million by not going to AWS. Well, turns out two things are true in that case. First of all, they violate the you are not Google rule because they run the third largest web crawler on the planet right after Google and Bing. So they have issues that most of us don't have. The second is, they were looking at, well, what would it take to move our precise architecture based on lots of fairly intric intricate hardware decisions to AWS? And that's not how you would ever do it. If they had started in the cloud, they would have a different architecture that would have completely different cost drivers. Um, another one we see a lot is no ability to assign costs well. And this is unfortunate because if I had gone back 50 years to the mainframe era, some of you have heard of it, um, assigning costs was fairly trivial because when IBM invented the mainframe, their whole concept of how computing would work was there would be a bunch of these big things and you would slice them up and rent them out to people a little at a time. So tracking who was using what is embedded into every level of how an IBM mainframe works. I'm not old enough that I worked on mainframes, but I'm old enough and spent enough time in financial services that I've been around them. And we're still catching up to things that IBM could do on mainframes in 1960 in terms of tracking who's doing what and what the costs related to it are. Um, it's especially hard in some organizations today where you have multiple layers. Yes, you have a consumer-facing application, but you'll have some sort of platform below that, and maybe you have some database platforms and off-site storage, uh, and all of these interact with each other. So who actually owns the cost of that platform that runs a database that also runs a Kubernetes cluster that your application runs on that uses the database? How do you track all of these things? Is a hard problem. Most companies don't do it well. And when I talk to AWS cost consultants, people who do this professionally, they say that's usually where we have to start just having that conversation about what are the costs we're gonna assign to what pieces of the business. Um, it's usually easier when you use a lot more cloud-based services, although there's a lot more stuff going on on-prem that has borrowed from things that the cloud has done, um, and a lot of open source tools these days that make that a lot easier, <clears throat> or are beginning to. Um, we have horrible metrics. We usually have great technical metrics. In fact, we have more technical metrics than we generally can use. Um, I like to refer back to this definition of what a metric is. It's a quantitative, quantitative measurement that provides insight into inputs and outputs of a process. Um, it's quantitative, that means you can compare it, ideally, 
all the way across your organization. It is a measurement, which is to say it is generated automatically. It comes out of some system that is reliably and consisting, consistently capturing that number. It's not something that somebody typed into a spreadsheet. It provides insight. One thing about costing is there's no truth. There's insights, there's directional information. Truth in cost accounting doesn't exist. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. And it's based on inputs and outputs. Typically with cost, it's dollars are the input. We put money in and we get something out. Um, very often when I'm talking to executives, they'll be saying things like, no, we just need to reduce our costs. And I'll say, no, we need to reduce our costs within certain constraints because it's costs per something. And the something may vary, but it is cost per something. And I'll get some pushback on that. And my, the go-to answer that I've been using has been, well, if it's not cost per something, then I can reduce your costs to zero. Give me the old administrator login to your cloud account. I'll go in, I'll delete it, and you'll have no costs. And then, of course, the answer is, yeah, but that's not what I meant. Okay, so what did you mean? It's cost per something. What is the something that you want to come out? And that's where the interesting conversations start. Um, sorry, I advanced myself. Um, We've got to be careful with metrics, especially with costs, because we're engineers and we game everything. Um, I was listening to a presentation yesterday about how, well, actually it was Forrest uh, Brazil's talk late last night where he talked about how, oh yeah, somebody said we need to be running at 80% utilization. So they just inserted lots of um, weights into code to always hit 80% utilization. And that sounds ridiculous, but I know of a situation where a company had a nasty habit of periodically telling everybody, cut 10%. And, well, you can imagine how that worked out. I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. There's a bunch of stuff here you can read. I won't bother going through all the details of what Deming didn't say that you believe he said, what Drucker didn't say what he believed he's, you believe he said. Uh, what I will say about metrics and management is really don't measure what you don't want to be forced to manage because once you measure it, you probably will be forced to manage it even if that was never the intent. Um, OKRs are great if done right because they set an objective and let the people who are actually working the problem figure out what should the target be. Um, another anti-pattern, this one is still, well, now we move into architectural. Those tend to be, the previous ones were pretty strategic. But at an architectural level, sometimes we get the opportunity to design things right from the top or right from a green field. And we should think about cost when we do that. Um, yesterday I had the opportunity to hear Corey Quinn, who's an AWS cost consultant, um, speak about something completely different, but one of the questions that was asked was, as a cloud economist, um, how do you recommend people design this stuff? And his answer was, you've got to design something to work. Don't spend all your time up front thinking about how much is it going to cost because you don't know how it'll, it'll evolve. But going back to the IBM example, think about what you might want to collect in the future and make sure you're considering that. Um, Think about what the right architectures are, given the state of the world today. 
10 years ago, I would not have been telling anybody that their default choice for an architecture should be containers and serverless. But today, I probably would if that's where you're starting. It may not be where you end up five years down the line, and you might want to think about an architecture that allows you to make that move as you grow to the point where serverless starts getting really expensive if you get there. But also keep in mind, you might not get there. Serverless might remain the right place forever. Um, so think about that. And there are lots of open source alternatives to help optimize this these days. Um, cost management as a standalone, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because um, as I say at the bottom, it's burnout inducing and leads nowhere. I know this personally. I spent a few months at a company um, during a hiatus from AWS where they asked me to basically do that. And it is a horrible, horrible thing to do. Uh, we're shifting everything left. And that is including cost. So if you set up this separate standalone piece of the organization that is going to manage our costs for us, but oh, by the way, they don't write any code, they don't own any applications, they don't run any systems, they don't manage the platform, but they're gonna solve all the cost problems. Well, that doesn't work well. There can and should be an, an independent team to make sure that there is consistency across the organization, to make sure that metrics are captured, that things are highlighted when they should be. Um, today, we tend to refer to that role as FinOps. Uh, but it can't just be, oh, you're going to solve it, go off and solve it, come back later. Uh, it was a horrible experience. Um, ongoing review, or lack thereof. We don't do this well. Even companies that try to do this well do, don't do this well. Uh, as I said, the point is to shift left. Shifting left means more sharing of information quicker. A lot of companies don't want to share cost data. In some cases, the excuse tends to be, oh, that would share something proprietary. Well, yes and no. AWS costs or any cloud's baseline costs are not proprietary. You can look them up on a website. Now, you probably are under a legal obligation to not broadly disclose any discounts, but that doesn't mean you can't give the baseline, which is, if not perfect, because discounts can vary across products, are at least directional and provide feedback to the engineers who you are moving more and more of this responsibility onto. Um, so that's a fail. Um, if you're not willing to share cost data, most of this will not work uh, in a fast-paced, again, shift-left environment. If you have the right metrics and you're looking at them and you're reviewing your cost dashboard as regularly as you review your operational dashboard, you will see things, you'll see them quickly, and you'll be able to correct them quickly. You'll also usually be able to attribute the change to something you've done recently. I noticed that recently just in my own AWS bill. All of a sudden, my S3 tripled. Well, it turns out I had changed something in my internal backup storage that caused a whole bunch of information, well, a whole bunch of system folders in Windows from every single one of my machines to be copying copied to my NAS, which is then replicated over to S3, which meant that every single day I was rep replicating an additional, oh, 20,000 files. So yeah, uh, that got expensive for a few days, but because I was reviewing it, I could figure it out very quickly and I knew exactly what I had done. It wasn't that far in the past. Important questions. What can we turn off? Uh, 
as a former AWS employee, I believe strongly that if companies actually reviewed and figured out all the logs they're keeping and how long they're keeping them for, uh, S3 profitability could probably be crushed because you would just eliminate, you might eliminate 30% of global data storage just by getting rid of, Justin's laughing. <laughs> At least 30%, or, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you'd keep 30% and eliminate 70% of global data just by not keeping logs that you don't use, don't remember you have, but are still paying for. Uh, And yeah, what can we turn off? What can we not store? And again, I'm not gonna talk about actual versus budget forecasting. That's a huge part of what FinOps organizations are doing these days. Again, to quote Corey Quinn from yesterday, he basically said, no, most of the companies who are talking to me aren't looking for cost reduction. They're looking for cost understanding and predictability. That's where you get to once you can figure out your costs, what your costs are in the first place. Um, another one I see is no reviews of what you have and how you could change it. I've seen companies that are still running instance types, um, I'm not sure about the other cloud providers, but AWS never obsoletes an instance type. Uh, if you set it up four years ago and you still ask for that instance, you will get it. And you will get the cost and performance of five years ago as opposed to today. Uh, but you don't always want the latest one because if you look at some of the most recent ones they've put out, they've actually started getting more expensive. Historically, you could always move to the next generation and it would be more performance for less or more performance for the same. Now they're increasing the prices uh, on the seven Gs. Um, is it better? You won't know until you benchmark it. Uh, one of the things I learned from the few months I spent at Stripe was they did a really, really good job of benchmarking. Uh, they would not put a new instance type into service or a new instance family into service until they compared it to what they were already using and understood mostly at a performance level but also at a cost level. What are they getting? What do they have to change when they go to that new instance type? Can they use fewer vCPUs, less RAM, they knew. And it's one of the things I thought they did really well. Uh, you know, there are new storage capabilities coming al along all the time. A uh, huge number of companies haven't moved to um, intelligent tiering in S3 as their default, which again, I would not have thought five years ago that I'd be recommending a default other than standard, but Today I am. It's a starting point. It's not where you will probably end up for most of your data, but understanding what that gives you, it's a relatively new change. It's only a couple of years, and there are new ones all the time, and prices change all the time. So review and benchmark matters. Um, you might be able to reduce data transfer fees. That's what I spent three years of my time at AWS working on was basically EC2 networking, data transfer, um, private link, API gateway. Uh, all of those are new things. They are things that change. You need to benchmark. You need to understand them. You need to understand the cost impacts of them. And again, I haven't talked much about cloud, on-prem, buy versus build. These are also things you should be looking at. Uh, and these reviews tend to be different from regular cost reviews. These are more architectural, more done by engineering teams. That's why I've split out the two slides. Uh, but this is still something you need to do regularly, maybe not as regularly. This is maybe more of a quarterly or biannual type review. Um, across the board targets, 
suck. Um, there's no other word for it. I was a victim of this. Usually it reflects a management that is suddenly under pressure, it doesn't really know where their costs are coming from, so they just will say, everybody costs 20%. It's bad. Um, I quote Corey Quinn on this one, where it hits different teams differently. Um, Corey says, for one team it's, we'll cancel a couple of projects, for another team, I guess we'll all take a pay cut and work two to a laptop. Uh, slightly exaggerated view, or maybe not, but it hits different. Uh, one of the reasons for that is it particularly hits teams that have been doing the right thing. If you've been running lean and completely optimizing your spend, and team down the hall has been running extremely bloated for the past two years, when cut 20% comes down from above, the team that's been running super bloated is the team that can meet that target tomorrow. Uh, again, this creates those perverse incentives I talked about earlier. Uh, I know of at least one team where, in a company where this kind of thing was common, they knew if we've got a down quarter, everybody's gonna be told to cut something, and there was a system there, I won't mention the company, it's a long time ago, but I still won't mention it. Um, there was a system that was just constantly, continuously, uh, calculating pi to the millionth digit. And <laughs> it, uh, it could be triggered by a feature flag, it could be dialed up and down as to how many parallel threads were working on this problem 24 hours a day because when that order came down, you wanted to be able to quickly, over the course of four weeks, dial down your costs and declare victory, and then slowly dial them back up as things at the company got better and people were paying less attention, so you could be ready the next time. Um, you don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, a lot of things that go on around cost, and this is where some of those quotes from Drucker and Deming matter, um, are really about motivating behavior and the wrong patterns or the wrong anti-patterns really motivate the wrong behavior. Um, at the very least, it encourages backpocketing. These are the situations where, no, you're not gonna run a bad routine to just soak up CPU, but maybe you've got some improvements and you hide them behind a feature flag and wait until someone asks you to do it. You'll still do it, but you'll go six months before something that could have been put in production actually is. Don't do that. Um, regular review, regular ongoing uh, <clears throat> understanding of the costs is a better way. And finally, tools. I'm a strong believer in the simple truth that if you can't do it manually, a tool will never save you. Tools are great. They allow you to do things at massive scale that you would not be able to do if um, you didn't have that tool. But I used to be a project manager. I would tell people, no, throw away MS Project or whatever, or Jira or whatever you're using. Here's a bunch of Post-it notes. Show me that you can run a project on a whiteboard with post-it notes. Uh, I still believe that's true. If you don't get those basics, the tools won't help you. When it comes to, especially cloud costing, most of the tools are immature. The space is still developing. I'm seeing a lot that look promising, but nothing I can strongly recommend right now for the general case, here and there for specific use cases. Yeah, there are good things out there and there will Certainly be more, I know of at least two in development that I'm really interested in seeing. Hopefully they'll let me get pre-production versions of those. Um, but you know, tools, any tools, are gonna require staffing, they're requiring change, they'll require changes to your process. Again, going back to that first slide, know how much you can spend, know how much it's worth spending to do all this. The amounts of money that I could spend 
to save money at AWS are far greater than I will ever see in my life um, anywhere else. So know what the tools, know what you need to do and make sure you find a tool that does it and does it well. Again, the space will mature a lot more that it'll be easier to figure out than it is right now. And remember, as with any vendors, the salespeople and engineers will not tell you all of the pitfalls, so you've got to figure them out yourself. And then a bonus. Um, in preparing for this talk, I checked out a bunch of videos online. I took a couple of classes. One of the ones I took was a cloud guru who used to be a great education provider, at least for cloud-related stuff. They're now owned by, by Pluralsight and have put out what I consider a lot of and shitified content, one of which is the AWS cost management deep dive, where one of the recommendations was you should set up rewards programs to reward people for reducing costs. And there's something called the COBRA effect. Um, it's generally a perverse incentive. It comes from a almost certainly bullshit story by the British colonial powers in India who decided we need to get rid of the cobras in New Delhi. So they put out a reward for every dead cobra that people brought in. So people started breeding cobras to kill them and bring them in. And then supposedly the brilliant British authorities uh, then realized, well, we shouldn't be pay paying people to do this. So they stopped paying people to do this and everybody, of course, because I guess they were stupid in the view of the colonialists, um, Everybody just released the cobras in their own neighborhoods and compounded the problem. Uh, almost certainly did not happen that way. Um, but it, it's something to remember. Um, you encourage people, you, if you're gonna pay people to cut costs, they'll just bloat their costs and then cut them. Uh, and then you'll change your mind and you'll still be left with bloated costs. Uh, it introduces something that my friends on Wall Street refer to as IBG, YBG thinking. Um, that's not a term we use a lot in tech, mostly because we don't get so much of our, our compensation in year-end bonuses. But in this case, they're recommending bonuses, so I thought I'd bring it up because um, this is how Urban Dictionary defines that term. I think it's about right. Uh, this is where it comes from. It's I'll be gone, you'll be gone. If you know you're gonna get a huge bonus for doing something, or even a smaller bonus, and you're already planning on changing jobs, well, you know, do we really need all those backups? Is that redundancy truly necessary? Um, I've talked to AWS and other cloud cost consultancies. They don't work on a commission basis. There are customers who like this, but um, they generally won't do it because they understand it sets up perverse incentives. And one of those people has told me straight out, yeah, I could do that. And he said, I would not be trying to screw my customers, but I know where the incentives are. So if I ever do this, it has to be a big enough job for me to retire on because I will completely destroy my own reputation. Um, if you want to work on commission, go into sales. Um, don't go into cost savings on technology. Okay, let me just look at time. We're kind of getting up there. I was going to quickly talk about a few things you could do right now. I'll just go through the first couple quickly. Whether your company is attributing costs or not, start thinking about how you might do it because you will either figure it out or someone will figure it out for you. It is better that you at least have thought through the problem, uh, especially if you're in one of those weird platform type teams where your costs are coming from someone three layers of abstraction above you. How are you going to figure out 
who pays for what piece of your budget. It's something to do. Um, what's that? Oh, this is old stuff. This is, I went to the end. That's unrelated. But learn something about cost accounting. Um, it's weird to stand in a tech conference and saying, you should say you should all be accountants. But I started from the premise that engineering is where economics and science meet. And I still think that's true. Um, Casey, who just spoke before me, spoke about the thing that he learned years ago that he didn't think had anything to do with tech that he has now figured out does. And I feel the same way about cost accounting. It's about the only thing I ever learned in business school that still has relevance. And in fact, it's one of the threads that has woven through my career consistently over decades. Um, it's a way of thinking. Cost accounting is not the stuff you use to put together financial account, financial statements. As I said, costing is imprecise. This is about a language of talking about who owns what costs. Where do we attach them? Uh, it's a language that people you work for speak. It helps you to understand it. I'm not suggesting anyone should go and spend a lot of time on this, but if you understand the principles of what is known as activity-based costing, you're so far ahead of anybody else who's probably in the room when you're talking about how much you're spending. The CFO will love you. And spend, think of a lot about where you and your team are spending your time. This isn't directly cost-related, but I think we've become very attached to a lot of tools that claim to make us productive and don't. So think about those. I won't say much about it. Um, thanks for all the people who've helped me do this, for the, to the various um, uh, meetup groups who I've presented earlier versions of this to, and everybody at scale, and especially to these two, who, well, do literally keep me up at night, but also keep me sane. And that's mattered a lot this past year. I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess we don't have a room person. Yeah. Justin, another former AWS colleague who isn't there anymore. <laughs> okay, so for on-prem, yeah. uh, what software do you recommend for monitoring? Boy, um, you know, that, 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 is, that is, as I said, the one thing that's really difficult to do is recommend a specific solution to a problem. You know, it depends what you're running and there are so many variables that go into that. On-prem, in a lot of ways, is easier because you have a fixed cost to your hardware um, that, and the rest of your infrastructure that doesn't change much. Um, I'm just saying right now I use my dad um, when he gets mad at the electricity bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good proxy. <laughs> oh, um, you know, electricity bill is a pretty good proxy for um, what your costs are. But the, the thing about it is what is driving those costs? What are you running that you need to monitor? Um, I'm running, like, data ingest because I do data ana an analytics on public transit. Ooh. So. We pull in like half a terabyte like every single day, so. That sounds like fun. And, 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 and it, it is the cost, you know, in the cloud, I'd be immediately saying, I'll bet there's a whole bunch of network stuff and data transfer that you're not even recognizing is there. I calculated it. It would be like, um, every single month would be like around $5,000. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it, 
that's almost sort of a, I need to look at your systems and see what you're doing to understand what's driving the costs. How, how much would those costs really change on a month-to-month -month basis if you were doing something different? On AWS, it would be exactly the same. Um, On-prem, I get to take, like, I turned off my NAS, so that, that's a lot of money saved. <laughs> okay. Because hard drives are a lot of electricity, so. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it, it depends what systems you're running, on the, r running it on. The tools are just really hard to say. Mm -hmm. As I said, there are lots of tools out there. Which ones are right? It's so situational that without knowing a bit more about about it, I really can't answer that. Okay, I'll talk to you after. You, yeah, we can talk a bit more. Got someone here. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, hi, I'm an engineer. Um, but yes. from what I understand, in software, the biggest cost is often people. And given the economy, there's all this layoff. So defensively, what would you, how, how can we gauge, I guess, our own, you know, like presence as a costing to the company? And like, our, you know, how do we run this on ourselves in the context of, or jobs or companies and such? Good question. At the very start, and I don't know if you were here at the very beginning, I pointed out that there are two big buckets of cost in every tech organization. There's the infrastructure and there's the people. And if you're fami familiar with Conway's law that basically says your system architecture and your organizations will always tend to mirror each other. It's not precise, it's not perfect, but it's a pretty good approximation in my experience. As we're shifting left, and engineers are now managing infrastructures as well, well, your infrastructure organization and your people organization are running into each other and paralleling each other much, and much, much more. So in terms of managing your career, you want to be focused in the places that can't easily be cut. And, you know, that's, you know, w w you know, if you want to parallel it to infrastructure, what can't go away? As I said, you know, if, if you're the person who's managing the uh, huge percentage of data out there that is useless logs, uh, that can go away. Uh, Um, this is actually related to your point about c cost accounting. Yes. Um, so in the companies or organizations that you've been working with, does the chargeback versus showback model work when it comes to transparency and accountability um, with the cloud teams that you, you kind of... Uh, uh, could, I'm sorry, the char chargeback... Chargeback versus showback. Yes. Which one... Which model do you see works better for accountability when it comes to distributing costs among teams? Oh. Boy, that's another great, it depends. Um, I, I'd be happy to take that one offline. There are so many, again, as I said, a lot in costing is really vague and specific accounting procedures. Um, <laughs> the answer again is it's extremely situational. I would say there's not an inherent advantage to one or the other. A lot of the complexity there is in the details of how are you accruing, th how are you attributing and accruing things. Yeah, uh, so I have a question um, as an engineer. Yes. Um, I've worked on teams where our products were supporting the entire organization, like yeah. let's say login or databases. Like how do you separate or attribute um, either costs or perhaps profits uh, to those kind of platform level uh, organizations or teams? Um, once again, there is no answer. Historically, the answer for a lot of those things was we'll just consider it overhead. But then you get the question of, well, who gets which portion of the overhead? Because in typically, in any cost accounting, whether it's standard costing or activity-based costing, which tends to be what we use in developing software, uh, you're going to want to attribute out that overhead. Um, 
and I've seen a bunch of different approaches to it. With data platforms, it can be data or amount of data stored, or it could be depending on data created or data used, or what's the CPU that goes into pulling out the data. Um, and very often, if you don't do this well, you either undercount or overcount. So um, for things like logins, you know, a login, you're probably not spending enough on a corporate, as a piece of the pie, to spend a huge amount of money on it. You'll probably figure out some per login type cost. Uh, but th those are the big questions, and they tend to be very political questions, which is why I said in attribution, the sooner you do this, the better, because that's where a lot of the hardest conversations are gonna happen. Um, I have seen endless debates on just the question I was talking about of, we've got this data platform, and it uses CPU, and it uses storage, and it uses data transfer, and who owns what piece of that, and how do we allocate it out perfectly so that every, so that it all sums up to 100%. Um, it's a multi-dimensional problem, and it's, and it's difficult. Yeah. Hey, uh, speaking yeah. from, uh, just asking a question as an engineer, Yes. So uh, in the past, what I noticed is that a lot of the scaling decisions is usually based on the worst case workload. And like in space like FinTech, you tend to have very spiky workload in the beginning of the month, the last of the month, right? Yeah. So are those just kind of inevitable costs in your view? Or like what, what's your take on like any optimization we can do to keep the bill low, right? Um, boy, Justin and I were just having a huge conversation about this yesterday. Um, we've been moving more and more to less overhead, um, targeting the 90% case, not the 60%, or targeting 90% utilization, not 60% utilization, and depending on scaling capabilities and other capabilities that the cloud gives us, to bump that up. And that's especially true if you're talking about scheduled events, which I dealt with at AWS. My biggest customer for several years was Amazon Retail. Oops. And, well, we knew what the big days were gonna be. So we could manually scale. Remember, that is, manual scaling is kind of a dirty word in DevOps circles these days because you want everything to be automated. But if you have set dates, if you have month beginning, month end, um, if you're in the tax business, mid-April, uh, it's okay in those cases to do it manually. In many cases, it could be better. You will spend less on doing it manually than you will on trying to automate it imperfectly. And as I said, AWS does it, so if AWS can't be bothered with automating that, you probably can't either. Again, go, go to that scale question. Uh, you probably can't justify that. We've got about five more minutes. Hi, uh, the V4? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, so um, um, I gradually noticed more and more how um, 20, 25 years ago, the, the, the big infrastructure providers were like the database, like Oracle, for example. Yes. And um, I, I feel like the circle is now complete because uh, you were talking about uh, don't try to save by um, being agnostic, being cloud agnostic. And it reminds me of uh, a famous book for 20 years ago by an, an Oracle VP about uh, don't try to be database agnostic. So um, I, I, feel, I feel like the circle is now complete and, and the infrastructure moved from software companies to cloud providers. Um, that is true to a degree. Uh, but it, it's a circle that, it, it's not even a circle, it's a cycle because 
I've been in this for a while, as I'm sure you have, and I can remember when IBM was telling you, no, just plan around us, and then we moved to, no, you can run it on anything, any PC, anywhere. That was what Microsoft told us to do. And then we consolidated around some big software companies for business purposes, at least, like Oracle, like SAP. And then we went towards open source and Linux and everybody running their own serv servers, and now we're consolidating into cloud providers. It ebbs and flows, so you're not wrong. Uh, I think it's the nature of our business to consolidate things once they hit a certain critical mass, and then we're gonna figure out the next thing, and that is not going to be consolidated for many years to come, and eventually it will. <laughs> and the costs, you know, and again, the costs will move up the food chain and, you know, the people lower down. I think we have time for one more question. I think we have one more. You know, one yes. of the challenges I ran into uh, relatively recently was trying to help a customer with their Azure bill <laughs> to the degree of um, they couldn't even explain their bill. Oh, most people can't explain their bill. Most I'm, AWS yeah. cost consultants, and those of you here at scale may know Corey Quinn, that's his business. Yeah. He will tell you, my business is explaining the indecipherable AWS bill. Yeah. Um, understanding it is key. That's why I started from figure out how to attribute your costs. Figure out this huge bucket that shows up as an S3 line item and figure out how to split that up. There are lots of tools to do it with, and the same is true for Azure, um, using different account numbers. Um, this is another mistake people make, is run everything in one account. The cloud providers used to tell you to do that. They don't anymore because they realize that's a horrible way to keep track of things. Uh, use tags, use all of these tools they give you to be able to say, this thing belongs to that organization. Uh, then you can start maybe not deciphering the bill, but at least understanding where the costs are coming from. Uh, a huge amount of the complexity in the bill is there are some things that you can just never easily predict, like cross-zone traffic on a cluster that runs in multiple zones. That's unknowable in advance. Um, <laughs> for, what, for what it's worth, you guys talked about logs and it yeah. made me think, backups was the big surprise for this customer. Like their storage was off the charts and it was like there's no way my project created that storage and when we dug into it, yes. it, was, their, it was their backup policy. Yeah, um, as I said, my personal backup at home tripled my S3 bill because I changed one configuration setting in the backups. And I would not have, I didn't even think about it at the time. Fortunately, I review my bill often enough that I saw this happen three days after I made some minor configuration change, and it some of where my brain put two and two together, and I said, oh, that must be a result of this. I better change that setting back. All right. Let's Anything one else? More, one more I'm happy to talk to people. <laughs> yeah, and you'll be around for more questions, so. Yeah, I'm here. All right, thank you. Okay.